Now, last week I gave you a little bit of a heads up of what we're going to talk about this week. And, um, you know, when we say politics in church, I think it can raise our heart rate a little bit. Uh, it can give us a little bit of anxiety. And I want to share with you, it does me as well. <laughs> uh, we're in good company. You know, it, it can be one of those tough topics. Sometimes we see uh, the relationship of politics like a baseball game. Right, where you already have the team that you're choosing for, who you want to win. And you have a uniform. You have chants that include curse words. And you want your team to win. You're cheering them on. You're promoting them. You're talking to other people about who you want to win. Uh, you have signs. You're invested in this baseball game. And then someone says they're going to talk about it. Maybe like I gave you this update last week. I said, hey, we're going to look at it, not from the ground floor, but maybe a little bit higher and look at what scripture says about it. You're, you're thinking, okay, th this is like a, a, a play in a baseball game at home plate, right? Because this play is important play and my anxiety is going to be reduced a little bit if you make a call in my favor. I mean, if the ump goes with what the play is and agrees with me, then, then we're going to be okay. But if Jeff something, says something that I don't agree with, well, I'm going to ask him to check his glasses a little bit. I'm going to see if we can get another ump. I'm not quite sure. And so we, we just have our, our, our heartbeats are going a little bit quicker, right? Like what is going to happen when we talk about politics and church? Is this even right? And I, I want to settle it a little bit, right? I want to calm you from the start. To say, I'm not going to make any calls like an umpire because politics is not a baseball game. Politics is chaos. Politics often seem like a war. And I'm not going to dive into the, to the ground level of things and be an umpire and make these, these calls. I don't think that's what Scripture is asking me to do. I don't think script, that's what Scripture is asking really many of us to do when it comes to politics. Okay, so just, it's okay. We could take a collective sigh of relief. But a bigger question might be, is it okay to talk about politics in church at all? Like, is this something that we should even be doing? Now, I want to bring up a story that happened to me the first time I moved to Pennsylvania. In fact, it was before we even moved here. We were coming from Florida. Like I said, that's where we were for many years. And uh, right before we were moving, I had to bring my car up separately. And then I was going to fly home and then drive up with the family and the dogs and all this stuff. And so I drove my car up first with a friend and we stayed for the first weekend that I was here in Pennsylvania. And it so happened to be the weekend where uh, there's a promotion, kind of a national promotion called the National Day of Prayer. And it happens every year. Kind of the, the thought behind it is to get churches to pray for our leaders, which we're told in scripture to do. And so some different churches in the area, including Norham Christian Church, had an event at Irwin Park. They rented the amphitheater and they had several ministers come and give devotions and pray and then kind of ask people to get into small groups to pray amongst each other. And so like I said, this is my first time in Pennsylvania, coming up, checking out what it is just for the weekend before we move. And so I went to this event thinking this would be great to meet some other people in the community, not just normal Christian church people. And so we're sitting there and um, they ask, okay, now break out into groups and, and pray. And so I was paired up with someone that was getting very excited about the topic at hand. Uh, they were motivated by the devotions. They were praying. They were excited. Like they were ready to take America back because that's what they were thinking. They, like back with prayer, all this stuff. And so when we split up, he said these words. And I remember these words because I was just blown back. He said, man, this is, this is what it's all about. This is what we need to preach about. This is what pulpits are for. And I thought, pulpits aren't for politics. And so I, I thought, what? I don't, and, and, and even from that moment, like that, that's been ringing in my head. And I, I, do we swing the pendulum completely to the other side where we we're completely devoid of politics in the pulpit, right? If we say, well, the pulpit's not for politics. We're not just promoting who to vote for, that's for sure. But we do we just stay away from politics at all. But the problem with that is we can never talk about King Jesus. We can never talk about the kingdom of heaven. Those are very political, rich 
terms. Jesus is coming into town on a donkey and he's saying, this is going to be my my political stance. It's not going to be like other kings that come on horses. Jesus is very political in the way he's going about things. And so we can't stay away from them. I mean, we would not talk about all these different things. You may be thinking, well, I'm not thinking about politics in that respect. You know, the kingdom of heaven and King Jesus. And I would ask you why. Why, when we talk about politics, do we only think Republican and Democrat? Why don't we think of King Jesus and the kingdom of heaven? And so that's where we're going to land today. We're going to talk about the concept of kingdom. And we're going to take kind of this 5,000 foot view above the politics in America and see how this concept of of kingdoms in scripture might, might rebalance us when it comes to our understanding of what's happening in our nation and where we as Christians need to be. That's one of my goals in this series. Another goal is to see where our priorities are as Christians. And then to help us with the process of, de- de- uh, oh no, what's that word? Uh, de- determining, discerning, that's the word I'm looking for. Discerning how we go about being a, being a citizen of God's kingdom, but yet still being involved in the things of this world. And so I want to explain kingdoms here a little bit. Our definition for kingdom this morning is, is our reach of our will and what we can do when it comes to uh, our individual kingdoms. And so the definition of kingdom that we're using this morning is our range of effective will. Our range of effective will. Uh, so this is, you know, your kingdom that you might have, and we all have our own kingdoms. In fact, Everything in this world has its kingdoms. And so I asked Alison Murray, our director of children's ministries, if she had something that could, could help me illustrate kingdoms. Like I was thinking like circles, like where circles overlap when we come close. Uh, she had these play mats with animals on them. So we're going to use that for this morning a little bit. Alligators definitely have their kingdoms, right? Like you go into that water and you're like, oh, I know who's in charge. You know the alligator's kingdom, right? It doesn't matter if you're in Disney World or not, they're going to eat you up, right? So that happens. Sorry, kids, it, it's true. Um, alligators have their kingdom. Hippos, hippos are like one of the deadliest mammals ever, right? You get in their kingdom and you're going to know you're in their kingdom. It, it's their range of effective will. They have their territory that they protect. Now, this isn't just true about animals. It's true about you and I as well. We all have our own kingdoms. Some are bigger, some are smaller. If you have employees that work for you, they expand your kingdom when they're working for you. They are doing your will and what you want them to do. Now, how well they do it or not, I don't know. But that's part of your kingdom. If you're single and you live by yourself, when you go home, that is your kingdom. The dishes are done when you do the dishes. It's your range of effective will. The lights get turned off when you turn them off. For me, with children, my house is not fully my kingdom. The lights do not turn off. I don't know. The, the kids leave the room and they decide the light still needs to be on. Even though I tell them, I want this to be my will that the light turns off when no one is in there. It doesn't happen. So my, my range of effective wills may be a little bit smaller. But I get to choose to some degree where my kingdom is. And man, my, my kids might do my will in some areas and expand my kingdom a little bit. They may not in other areas. And so my kingdom shrinks a little bit. We all have our own kingdoms. But beyond that, we live in the kingdom of America. You pay your taxes, you follow the laws. It's, it's in a sense, a kingdom. But there's even a greater kingdom than that, and we'll, we'll call it the kingdom of the world. The kingdom of earth, that we all have shared humanity. We all have shared experience. This is cancer. This is moments of joy. This is fears. This is collective experiences that we have as humanity, that we all understand the, the culture at large. This is, this is the kingdom of the earth. We're going to focus on that a little bit this morning. And the other kingdom we're going to focus on is the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. These two phrases are used almost interchangeably in scripture. And this is a kingdom that enters rather quietly that Jesus brings a new reality to when he is born and he begins his ministry. In fact, even before his ministry 
uh, gets started and Jesus' name becomes a household name. We see this kingdom of heaven concept happening already. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, it says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So here's John saying, look, this is, this is Jesus. You better get ready. The kingdom of heaven has come near. And Jesus starts his ministry in the same tone and becomes a theme of his ministry. Next chapter, chapter 4, verse 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent, you better get ready. Kingdom of heaven has come near. But it's, it's a different concept of a kingdom than most people are used to. They're used to seeing this physical kingdom and having a physical king on a throne and being a harsh taxes enacted on them and asking them to do certain things. And so Jesus has makes it clear through his Sermon on the Mount what, what it's going to look like to be part of the kingdom. And then he proves it through miracles that the kingdom is real and it's different than expected. And he shows through his resurrection that we all have a chance of being resurrected into the kingdom, that the promise is true for all of us to be part of a of a kingdom, but there's still confusion around the kingdom. And just because it's so different, people are asking a lot of questions. And so Jesus includes it even in things like the model prayer, the Lord's prayer, and how we should interact and ask for this kingdom. And Matthew 6, verse 10, it says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so this kingdom is something that we can all have somewhat of a responsibility for even in our prayers when we say, no, no, God, your, your kingdom come. Your will be done. Your range of effective will needs to be enlarged here on earth, just like it is in heaven. People still a little bit confused. And so he continues to teach his own disciples and others. Going to Luke 17, we see even more explanation by Jesus. Verse 20 and 21, he says, once... I'm being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. Jesus replied, the, king, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, well, well here it is, or, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Or some manuscripts say, it is within you. And so here Jesus is saying, there's a new kingdom, and we'll represent it with the lion, the lion of Judah. He's kind of a happy lion, isn't he? The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is a reality. The kingdom of God is a presence. In fact, you have a responsibility to, to enlarge in the kingdom. It is a reality for you as believers, and you continue it as believers every time you either do or pray for something on earth as it is in heaven. It's something great and a great understanding. And so this is the truth I want you to understand this morning when it comes to God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. It's not just a place you go to when you die, but it's actually a way of life you enter into under King Jesus. This is what Jesus is trying to get them to understand, that it's not a future kingdom that's going to be ushered in with a whole bunch of warriors like any other kingdom. It's actually come now in a reality that is fully present with Jesus and his believers, which includes you and I as Christians, not just as a future event, one day I'm going to get into heaven, but as a current reality when we decide I'm going to exchange my kingdom for God's kingdom. And that can happen now. And it happens under King Jesus. There's a long quote I want to read to you from Dallas Willard from his book called The Divine Conspiracy. And part of it is talking about this appearance of the kingdom that Jesus ushers into. It says, Jesus came among us to show and teach the life for which we were made. He came very gently, opened access to the governance or the kingdom of God with him and set afoot a conspiracy of freedom and truth among human beings. Having overcome death, he remains among us. By relying on his word and presence, we are enabled to reintegrate the little realm that makes up our life into the infinite rule of God. And that is the eternal kind of life. 
Caught up in his active rule, our deeds become an element in God's eternal history. They're what God and we do together, making us part of his life and him part of ours. There is immediate availability of the kingdom of the heavens to anyone who'd simply turn and walk in it. He preached discipleship as the greatest opportunity that any human being will ever have. So God's effective range of will is here. And you and I have a chance to enter into it, to take our finite little tiny kingdom and give it to him in an exchange. And this is not an even exchange. Sometimes we feel like, okay, well, I'll take God's kingdom. And I mean, God's kingdom comes with a lot of rules, doesn't it? I got to dress up for Sunday morning, oh my goodness. But I guess in the end, I get heaven, right? So I guess it's kind of an even exchange. Are we serious? We think we can hold on to this small, lonesome kingdom and think this is an even exchange when in reality, this is... This is a a kingdom that we've built to ourselves and we've white knuckled to keep it together just from falling apart. And we do everything to to lie to ourselves that this is what's gonna last the longest and this is what's most important. And I really can do it ourselves. And God is saying, no, no, no. Exchange that for something that really matters. Exchange that small, finite reality for something that is infinite and beautiful and joyous, and I will give you a reason not to fear or have anxiety anymore. But it's difficult. It is so hard because we've become so accustomed to our own kingdoms, right? We've become so, so used to doing it the way we want to do it. And so we try to grasp our kingdom back from God when, when we think there's things that we can do better than Him. And it's this war. It's this war, not, not a war, especially when we look at politics, not a, a war against Democrat and Republican. See, they're fighting for the same kingdom. In politics, they're, they're fighting for more power and control of the kingdom of this world. And we need to understand the reality of the war is actually the kingdom of earth against the kingdom of God. This is what's presented to us in scripture. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 for our Struggle isn't against flesh and blood. It's not about the kingdoms of this world, the things we see around us, but actually against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's what our battle is really all about. And so we have Satan who's trying to convince us that our kingdoms are what needs to be built bigger. And that we can do it on our own. And, and God might be good for some things, but not for everything. And so I need, to, I need to wrestle my kingdom back out of his grip and continue to build that and my priorities. And so I want to bring up a few things that we do see in our politics today. I'm calling these false gospels. Gospels that we get told are sufficient for faith and sufficient for salvation especially during the political seasons, and we can exchange God's kingdom for our kingdom so that, so that we can say we won, when in reality we're losing because we just bought into a false gospel. But this is exactly what Satan wants us to believe, because this is the war that is really around us, a war for our souls that will sell out for something lesser rather than accepting his kingdom. And so here's two different ways we see it. I'm sure we see it, we could Uh, use different words for it and different categories, but these are the two that we'll talk about this morning. The first one is this, a fixer gospel. There's a fixer gospel that we can see during difficult times, political seasons or otherwise. And this fixer gospel would tell us that uh, there's, there's a Jesus that can fix things and he's good at fixing things. If you've ever watched um, a show about, you know, mob families or crime families, there's, there's always a fixer. And the fixer is typically outside the family, uh, but the fixer is called in to help with a situation that, well, the, the family doesn't want to deal with. They don't want to get their hands messy. Right? Uh, hopefully, the, you know, it's probably something illegal that happened, and so the family doesn't want to be seen doing this, so they bring the fixer in to to take care of whatever happened. And it's actually better if the family doesn't know what the fixer's doing. And the fixer can just fix it and they don't have any need for the fixer outside of that until until they need the fixer again. And so we come to Jesus and we go, okay, Jesus is really good at fixing sin. 
And so I'm going to have Jesus come in when he needs to fix sin and teach about morality. I'm going to, I'm going to ask him to come in, but he doesn't really have any guidance on my life per se. But when I need Jesus to fix something, I'll have him come in and fix something. And then I'll have a need for him until well, I need something else fixed and what he does. And he's good at what he does. And so we can see this in politics where we, we, think, we, we use Jesus' name in one way. We go, well, Jesus needs to, to help this or Jesus can have a say in this. But then when it comes to other issues outside of what Jesus does, well, we have free reign, right? We can determine what, what issue should be raised or not or what issue I get behind or not. And I'm going to let Jesus do what Jesus does, but he's just fixing what Jesus fixes. Another gospel that could be similar to this is the toolbox gospel. The toolbox Jesus. And it shares some similarities in that we reduce Jesus to just a tool. A tool in my toolbox to use when, well, I need him to rally the troops a little bit. The life of Jesus doesn't really matter to me. The divinity of Jesus, I, I, I could take or not. The, the fact of the resurrection, well, that doesn't really matter in the end to me. What matters is that Jesus is a household name that can rally the troops. And so I'm going to pull Jesus out of my toolbox when I want him to get behind an issue and I want other people to get behind an issue and, and care about it. And if I say Jesus cares about it, well, that's going to pull in some votes or that's going to help me and my side win. I'm not really going to use Jesus throughout the rest of my life. He's not really useful there, but with what Jesus can do for me, I'll use him. He's reduced to a tool in your toolbox. So when it comes to my, our lives, my life, I'm thinking, do I see those false gospels and policies? Do I see those false gospels in my life? The question might be, do, are there scriptural mandates that I'm willing to overlook in politics or the rest of my life in order to fit a party line or to fit some, some issue that I want? And I just want to give you an example of that. In 2016, there's a very well-known Christian university president that became very outspoken in his politics, which took a lot of people back because he wasn't before this election. One issue for his that became very popular was the national debt. And so he used this wor these words with the national debt. It's a monumental moral issue that amounts to stealing from future generations and is a matter of biblical Christian worldview. That's a pretty bold stance to hold, especially when his candidate was elected, the national debt went up 40%, and he's quiet on it. There, there's absolutely no talk from this person about how that affected him, about how he's disappointed in his candidate, how that didn't align with how he saw things morally and, like he said, a biblical worldview. To me, it doesn't matter who this is. I'm just using this as an example of what can happen when we reduce Jesus to just a tool to use or we, we reduce Jesus to a fixer. Now, does Jesus fix things? Absolutely. He fixes our sins. That's part of the gospel. Our biggest problem as humanity is our sin and Jesus fixes our sin, but it's a reduction of the gospel if we just hold it there. Jesus is good just on Sunday as he is on Thursday when we vote. Jesus is calling us into a different kingdom. Jesus is calling us into something so much greater than just a tool to be used or just as a fixer. Jesus isn't a fixer. He's the Messiah. Jesus isn't just a tool. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And so we need to understand the, the kingdom that Jesus is drawing us into as believers. We cannot allow our, our political parties to frame issues that Jesus has already framed just so they, they fit within a narrative. Rather, we need to look at the kingdom of God first and let that adjust our vision and our priorities. And then ask where we fit into a party or where we fit with certain issues. We can never reduce Christianity just to affirm our political stances. Okay, where do we go from here? How do we find ourselves in this greater kingdom 
And how does this kingdom align ourselves or disalign itself with the world we still live in? Because we still live in the here and now. And so I want to open up a passage and look at the priority of the kingdom and what the kingdom does for us as believers. I want to go to the Gospel of Matthew. Since we're there, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 8. And here we have two back-to-back stories that I think show us a little bit about what God is calling us into as kingdom citizens, as Christians that are part of this kingdom. So we're going to open up verse 18 through 22 here to begin. And when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. And then a teacher of the law came to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Jesus, this is harsh. I mean, not allowing someone to mourn the death of their father, but you see the priority of the kingdom that Jesus has. He's saying, look, we have things to do in this kingdom. Yes, there's a reality of these these things in the world that you participate, but as Jesus is on earth, Jesus is leaving. He's he's leaving this place. And if you're going to follow the kingdom, that day you had to follow him. And there's a cost to it. And so Jesus is, is asking people to calculate the cost that there's a reality to this new kingdom too. And then the story goes on. Verse 23, it says, Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. And the disciples were worried. They they woke him up saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Now, why is it exactly that, the, that Jesus was so disappointed in his disciples? I mean, are the disciples to blame for, for this, this, this huge storm that is happening? They, they've never seen Jesus control the weather like this before. Are they to blame in this emergency that they'd wake Jesus up? They've never been in an an emergency like this before where Jesus was just found sleeping. They didn't know what to do. Are they to blame for that? Uh, There might be some of that here, but I think there's a greater disappointment that Jesus sees in their fear. That their fear determined the faith that they had in Jesus and his kingdom. That they would be so shaken to think it is all over. All of us are done for because of this physical storm. They didn't know what to do. Jesus, we're going to drown. I mean, dude, what's going on? Everything is over and you're you're just sleeping in the boat? The reality of this earthly kingdom was stronger than the reality of God's kingdom. That with Jesus, there is no better place to be. It comes storm or not. This may seem like a small difference, but it's so important to realize that that sometimes our fear or the reality of what's happening in this kingdom causes us anxiety and fear of of God's kingdom and our trust in Jesus. When the reality should be completely switched. That because we have so much trust and faith in Jesus, it sounds like there's a storm outside right now. But because our trust and faith is in Jesus, it doesn't matter what this world is bringing us. It doesn't matter the storm around us. It doesn't matter our political season or what people are saying about me or what people are saying about God. I know his kingdom and their reality and there's no safer place than with with Jesus. And so here's my last point for this morning. When Christians start to lose their faith in God's kingdom, they take matters into their own hands. When we start to lose faith in God's kingdom, we start wrestling our kingdom back. And we think, no, 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 I can do it. Or no, 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 God, I mean, Jesus is good enough, but not good enough for our politics. I mean, I got to take things in my own. I know what he said about this, but he doesn't understand the reality of the situation. And so even though the scripture says this, I'm going to vote this way. Or even though I understand uh, moral issues this way, Jesus is good for Sunday, but he's not good for Thursday when I go vote. No, 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 the reality of God's kingdom is... There's no better place than being with Jesus. 
And so I need to use that as a filter for politics. I need to use that as a filter for the storms of this world. I need to use that as a filter when everybody else is trying to convince me to do it a different way. That his kingdom is by far greater and more important than any other kingdom that I could have, any other kingdom that anybody else in this world can have. I want to end with a story. Um, I remember a, a teen conference that we were at and there was a speaker that was speaking to these high schoolers and he was talking about the kids, his own kids. And I think it piqued my ears because my kids were almost the exact same age as his were. And he started talking about how when they went to bed, they often had nightmares or they'd wake up in the middle of the night and come back down. And I'm like, this is exactly what's happening in our household. You know, you put them to bed and they get down sooner than you get downstairs. And you're like, well, I just put you to bed. What happened? Like, well, I got scared. So you go back upstairs with them and you try to talk to them. And what the speaker got convicted of is often he would go up and he would say, well, everything's going to be all right. But the truth of the situation from his perspective as he was speaking to his kids, it's just not true. I mean, everything may not be all right. As a dad, we try to do everything we can to protect our kids. I mean, at night we lock the doors and we, we keep things secure and we're ready. But the reality, and we've seen it this week with, her, with the hurricanes and tornadoes and things, like we, we can't 100% guarantee our kids everything is going to be all right. But we know somebody that can. And so as a father, he would say, look, I can't protect you from everything. But Jesus can. It may not mean he takes away the storm like he did for the disciples. It may be that the storm remains, but he's still going to protect us through it. And what's the worst that's going to happen? Well, well, we could die. Yeah, but then (laughs) we get to fully be in that kingdom for eternity. And how much faith and trust we can have in Jesus as that being our reality. It's a beautiful reality each of us can enter into. And it's a reality not just for the future, but it's a way of life under King Jesus. Jesus. And that gives us hope in our political season. It gives us hope in any season where we hear the thunder and lightning of the world and things are not going our way. Let me pray for us. Dear Lord, we are so thankful for the presence of your kingdom and the promise of your kingdom. It's not just a future hope where we still have to deal with things on our own here on earth and we struggle through life but a reality that you help us through life. And it's a reality that even now we can enter into the kingdom with your promise of eternity and and we can pray for your kingdom come now. And God, it's it's just such an encouraging thing to know that there's something more going on just beyond the reality that we see in front of us. That you're using the things we see in front of us to even build your kingdom. And so God, if we have a part to play in that during this political season, God, I pray that, I pray that we all play the part that you've asked of us. And as we continue through the series, we'll, we'll maybe learn what that looks like a little bit more. But God, you've called us to something much greater. And so I, I ask forgiveness for all of us when we step out of the greater reality of your kingdom and into just a puny kingdom that we've made for ourselves. I pray all this in your son's name. Amen.